have a special guest that's joining us. We have a trailer for what we're about to experience at the Montalban Theater. Check this out. Here's a quick tease of what we're about to see. The Batet Follies. At night, the city comes to life. Where the leather wings flap, the cat meows, and the pale smile laughs. It's here, and the creator is going to join us, Russell Beatty, who is the creator of this show, who is renowned for putting this stuff together. Welcome him, Russell. Hey, thanks for joining us, man. I was glad Love to be back. the tease. Let's put you front and center here. Uh, this you are first. Let's talk about the Empire Strips Back, mm -hmm. your epic show which is returning later this year to the Montalban. Yeah, I think it's back in October, I believe. But tell us about The Empire Strips Back, the, the how that show evolved, and how it became... I mean, it's run for months in, in not just the U.S., but other countries. Yeah, so we... Um, <clears throat> I started The Empire Strips Back years ago as a joke, um, and it just kind of kept growing and growing and growing... So we kind of became the behemoth that is now. I think there's three shows running at the moment. I, um, I've kind of Zach grown me. I've handed that off now um, to other uh, to local like US based uh, producers. So I think at the moment there's one in San Francisco, there's one in DC, and there's one uh, maybe just finished in Montreal, maybe. But there's three productions usually running. It, it opens up in Germany later this year, Mexico, it's been in France, the uh, UK. It's traveled everywhere. So it's kind of um, its own beast now. Um, and yeah, I haven't, I haven't had much to do with it for the last um, 18 months because I've been working on other projects. But um, yeah, it just kind of keeps growing and growing and doesn't seem to stop. And previous to that, you did a Game of Thrones themed burlesque show. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, I've done a lot of things. So I've done uh, Game <laughs> of Thrones. I've done the films of Quentin Tarantino. I've done, um, you know, Wizard of Oz. I've done all sorts of stuff. So basically, I'm kind of known for the theme parody burlesque shows, um, amongst other things. I saw the Tarantino one. My understanding is Tarantino attended. Uh, not to my one. Not to my one. Um, that one may have been a different one. There's no shortage of uh, Tarantino tribute ballet shows out there. <laughs> right. Well, now tell us about this. Uh, I've seen at least a tease of the show and your book. Not sure how much you can talk about the book. That oh, I can book, talk about everything. <laughs> okay. That book blew my mind. I showed it to Gary Beekler. I bought him a copy and sent it to him. Okay. When you first came out, I bought two copies because I thought, oh my God, I'm never going to be able to get this again, you know, because it's such a rare item. But tell me what went into this book, the uh, Gotham 1919 to 1939. Well, yeah, kind of, um, it started out as like a bit of an art project at first where I just wanted to kind of, I was a big fan of history and don't get me wrong, I love Batman, but I find the more he gets more tech orientated, the more I kind of lose interest. So I wanted to focus on a time period where he would make a lot of sense. And to me, it was between the two world wars. And I'm always fascinated by that period because there was a lot of change in the world. So when I um, started this project, I just want to do a real realistic take on Batman, just the most grounded version you'll ever see. 
um, in the public enemies period, you know, the period where prohibition was in and you had the celebrity gangster and the crash of the stock market and all these things were could like, you know, the world hadn't even been built yet the way we know it, but yet it was already collapsing, you know, and I, um, I just thought that was such an interesting time to kind of set Batman. So yeah, I did the book. I did it over 10 years. Um, for those who kind of have the book, they kind of can pick that up because I shoot with the same models over that period. So, uh, for example, my Robins, I shoot with them when they're like the first time I shot with them, they were 11 years old. And then when I brought them back for Nightwing and Red Hood and those older versions of the characters, I actually waited 10 years until they got to old enough to take their photos for Nightwing and whatnot. So I kind of, um, I kind of went overboard <laughs> with like the production of that. Um, and the whole point was in, in, in the story of the book, if you go to the epilogue, they talk about, you know, all these films and shows were got based on the exploits of Batman at the time. And um, one of the shows they talk about is the Batman Follies of 1929. So the show I'm doing in Hollywood is actually in universe um, of the book. Yeah, it's it's incredible. Like if Batman were real and set during the Prohibition era gangster, he like you said, it's logical for Batman to exist in that period Tech was kind of crude, these costumed flamboyant villains, him using just brute force and then becoming a legend actually during that time. I really think we're getting to the point where uh, modernity is not making things better. Modernity as applied to heroes and old legends and stories actually tends to make things worse. That's why setting things in the past, like the, the upcoming Fantastic Four movie, is set in the 60s, right? Mm -hmm. So this just makes so much sense. Now, what it went into the evolution of the show, which is I'll put the link in the in the description. I'm gonna share the uh share screen with this uh the Batet Follies of 1939. You can go and get tickets to see it right now in LA. Yeah, well, what went into it? Um, I suppose because after I finished with Star Wars. I was looking for something new to kind of do. And I wanted to tell the story, like continue the story of the book because I have I've basically written two sequels and then something else. Um, haven't started taking the photos yet, but I have all the pages accounted for and everything. And basically they were Metropolis 1925 to 1945 and Theramascura 1933 to 1963. Now, unfortunately, along with Gotham, um, I went a bit too big with my promotion and I got a cease and desist from DC and Warner Brothers. So I'm not allowed to sell the books anymore and not allowed to continue making them. Um, they asked me to change the name of the show. They actually tried to shut down the show. Um, what? Yeah. Okay. DC but, is now paying attention to you. Oh, but most definitely. I've been having a lot of conversations with their lawyers. Um, <laughs> so basically I offered them the book for free. I said, hey, guys, I, I said the concept is beyond me. It's the fans what are really running it now. Um, I'm just kind of feeding them and, you know, I'm like a lifeguard, just telling, you know, I'm like the dungeon master and they're all playing with, you know, with it, the stories. Um, they didn't care. <laughs> they didn't even respond to the email when I offered it to them for free. Um, so I've just been dealing with the lawyers and they've been, they basically wanted me to sign an agreement to lock me out of working on any DC things in the future, touching their characters, um, they're going to let me put on this one version of the show for like six weeks. And then I would have had to go through their lawyer to get permission in the future. So they came really hard on it, um, on us, um, straight up. And we try to explain to them that, you know, what's better, you know, us doing an original take on Batman for the fans, you know, to support, you know, the content that they've, they've, you know, parody laws exist basically to question the big powers, like the big, corporations out there like the people like media politics religion that's why you have parody laws so you the you get an equal voice when they're so powerful and what's more powerful than the biggest comic book ip owned by one of the biggest entertainment companies what's then funded by another billion dollar company and you know it's all the money men and gatekeepers what the industry is kind of known for these days which is kind of holding um 
corners by a leash. And you can't, can't um, put into society back-to-back -back Batman projects, multiple ones at the same time. Like, how many Batmans do we have at the moment, you know? Right. How, many, how many Jokers do we have in the last 15 years? You can't do that and just smother us with, and kill us with our own nostalgia without us being able to have a voice of this, of what we're consuming. You know, if you're not telling the stories we want to see, you can't stop other people. And I, like, as I said to him, I've never made money out of the book. The book was never about money for me, you know, and I always knew one day that they would probably want to say, no, we're always prepared to kind of offer him the book if they wanted it. Um, well, I have a question here. I mean, lawyers are one thing. They're doing their job because they have to appear to be useful to the corporation. Have you thought about reaching out to James Gunn directly? I would if I could. I've, I've reached. I've tried to reach out to a number of people over the years, like Jim Lee and a few other people. I just get radio silence, and then anytime I've sent books off to DC, I never hear anything. I've sent them over the. Uh, you know, I've reached out to them a number of times over the years, um, and they just. It's like you know any of the parody stuff I do, even though I have extreme success with you know, dealing with these IPs. And in the past, I've actually worked with HBO and um, whatnot with my Game of Thrones show. Like, you know, first they sent me a cease to desist, but then they started working with me. Um, and I started doing their like launches in Australia um, and things of every new season they did. Um, but yeah, I've, I've, I've realized that the biggest thing for what we can do is just put on the best show we can and like really engage people with, um, with what we're trying to do in the story because at the end of the day, I understand DC is a corporation. The person who doesn't like it this month might not be there next month and that person might have a bit more of an open mind. So I wasn't really prepared to sign their agreement. I basically told the lawyers to get um, just because, yeah, I didn't think it was ethical. I thought, guys, I mean, my legal rights to do a parody show. This is a parody show. And, you know, it's one of the last forms of free speech. And it just felt like, you know, they were trying to lock me out with a legal document. And they're asking a lot of me, which was not basic. There was no legal grounds for it. We've got over 3,000 people watching us live. Uh, we're also on X, all these things. Uh, we have questions for you from the chat. Mm-hmm. Let's let's go for first of all. Gatekeeper became a new member. Patch Patch Gilmer, Alan, if you would read the questions. Sure. Uh, Gotham 1919 uh, to 1990, uh, 1939 is one of the greatest coffee table books ever. Uh, like a dumbass, I ordered it from Australia site. It took forever to ship your buy, to ship by yours from the U.S. Uh, giant Panda King site. So basically, he's talking about in the early days, they used to ship everything from Australia. Everything now, if you buy through Giant Panda King, is shipped out of LA. But there used to be a bit of a wait um, for, for, for things to arrive from Australia. Yeah. But he loves it. Um, Razor Burn, uh, question for Russell. Would you consider doing a Lord of the Rings burlesque show? Um, I'd consider it, but I've, I've kind of got, I've only got a couple of more parody uh, burlesque shows in me. Um, and the one, the next big one I'm doing is based on Marvel comics, but like not the movies, the comics from the sixties and seventies. Mm. Um, and that's the next big one. And then after that, I've got a parody musical show based on Arnold Schwarzenegger, the rise and fall of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, but apart from that, after that, it's all original content from me. All right. Uh, Matthew Hammond for two DC is tone deaf. They're missing out. Yeah. All right. From uh, Davina Duckworth, uh, was it difficult to get license clearances for Russell? Uh, I believe the answer is yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Like you know, it, like I said, I, I I work in the very thin area, gray area of parody, where you have to kind of know what you're talking about. But you know, if you look at what we do, and then you know, you look at something like Vivid Films, Batman sixty six kind of um, porn parody. Um, that seemed to get away with it, you know, um, but DC seemed to come really hard on us for some reason. Yeah. Uh, is that it? No. no. Uh, for Foresight, parody is hard to pull off props to anyone who does it and does it well. Well, yeah, the good thing about this show is it's a review show. Like, so the review show were Burlesque, Vaudeville, and like things like Zigfield Follies, like the high-end showgirl shows. 
And it's got a history of this. Like, so basically, instead of us reviewing something that was real in society at the moment, we're doing a review show based on alternative history of Batman. It's a bit high concept and it's a bit meta. And it was meant to kind of go along hand in hand with my book. Um, because we're not allowed to sell the books, we've been ordered to destroy all copies, all the remaining copies. So if you come onto the show, you can get a book, but you have to take one. I'll give them to you for free. But if you take one, um, you have to promise me at some point you have to destroy them. Okay, I'll go to the show and destroy your book. I'd be yeah. uh, now. Now I want pleasure. to go to the show because <laughs> I want to destroy your book. Yeah. All right, from Krizik. Big question there. Uh, as it falls back to Atlas Publishing years, does Batman use guns again? Well, I don't get that specific. He he definitely does. He's a lot more brutal. Like you know, if you look at his battering, he only has one battering, for example, and that's um, a multi-use tool. It's kind of like oh, this big, and it's also a knuckle duster. It's got a blade on it. He uses it to help him climb and things like that. So the tools are a lot more basic and whatnot. Um, the book is presented more like a documentary where you just collect information and it's up to you to kind of fill in the gaps. Um, and that's why the book's engaging is because it doesn't give you all the answers. It gives you enough that if you want to go and research a bit of Batman and a bit of history, you can fill in the rest. All right. And then finally from Olaf, sort of Bat Noir. Yeah, it's a little bit earlier than Noir. Noir is more 40s and 50s. Um, this is very much set in the tw um, 20s and 30s. And any final thoughts? Now that the show is here, it's out, you can get tickets on the website. The website is, let me see it here, it's Bat Batet Follies 1939. Uh, it's in Los Angeles at the Montalban Theater. It is a blast. I've seen it. Uh, I recommend actually go see the show and then go around the corner to the scum and villainy cantina. There's a secret menu item. If you say you went to the show, they'll give you a drink that's inspired by the show. I I'm sure you knew that. I don't know if you knew that. I knew that was something. I didn't know it was a secret menu item. But... It's a secret menu. They bring you a drink that has like a, a little bat thing on it. Uh, you have inspired to by the show. Chris, it's cool. Like the museum is almost finished in the foyer. Like it, because the, we had a lot of trouble with this show. Like some, like our main, one of our main cast members, our Joker, he got his visa rejected. We had oh. to change our name. Our shipping container with all our props and costumes and everything only arrived three days before our opening night. Wow. So I think you came really early on and you only saw probably about 70% of the show, maybe 65%. Well, well, I'll uh, I'll see it again for sure, but yeah, Ted Follies because please. I feel like you need to see it because you may not ever get to see it. Exactly, right? come down. You have to buy a ticket before we get shut down. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, um, when you look at the creativity, uh, like like what you've done with the DC as a franchise, and I hope you do the Metropolis book and other ones you have on your plate um, is so much more creative of a vision of DC than what they're currently doing. Well, I hope, I hope they kind of wake up and know that there's a fan base here. Cause I told them, I said, guys, the way we could do this would be like this generation's kind of kingdom come. And I'm not trying to put it on the pedestal of that. I'm just saying like the way it was this unique take out of a time period and you know, what, what people want, but the, um, the main thing I'm just trying to do is just create the fan base for this concept because it's already out there. And it's just one of those things I just want people to be able to find find the poison what they like, essentially, because we're being force fed all this crap. And, you know, the fans are the ones who want this and they took it. Um, they took it. Sorry, I'm just looking at all the questions popping up. <laughs> um, they took it, um, you know, as... They, they're the ones who took it bigger than I could ever, you know, bat feed, made his videos and all the reviews and all the, you know, positive um, statements out there. I sent this all to um, DC and there's radio silence on that part. And all I hear back from them is everything they want me not to do. <laughs> so. what, what? Here's a question from Caveat Ties. Who did you go through to publish your book? Me. I'm self-published. 
that's the way to go. Yeah, and I, uh, I, I'm a professional who doesn't work in the industry. Right, and uh, Dark Herophant says the Montalban also had the Star Wars burlesque show, which is coming back. Mm-hmm. It'll be here, um, I think, from October to January. Right. So, uh, Russell, thank you so much for joining us. The link to the trailer for the show and the link to get tickets is in the description of this episode. Uh, Russell, we got to get together before you go back. When are you going back? Um, I'm probably going to be here to the, for the extent of the show. If we extend, um, hopefully everyone will go and buy tickets and we'll extend throughout the summer. Um, I'll have to pop back to Australia because I'm finishing up a feature film at the moment and um, I've got about two weeks of editing I need to finish on that. So, um, because we're trying to apply for South by's deadline. Um, so you got time, you got time. It's in the fall. So you got time, but, yeah, um, I've just got, I've got about, I've also got a ghostbusters book. I'm finishing at the moment as well. Oh, I cannot wait oh, for yeah. that. Yeah. I cannot wait. Well, it just, it's like, it's a love letter to ghostbusters. So it acknowledges everything from the games to the pizza hut commercials, to the modern films, to, you know, well, um, Poor Fig film, like all of it we kind of honor in some way. And the main thing for me now is just to kind of finish off all these projects I've been promising people. But until hopefully the audience keeps building on this uh, Batman concept and hey, fuck, if they can bring back the Snyder Cut, surely they can convince DC to let me do a couple more books. Awesome. Well, I recommend uh, James Gunn is very active on X on Twitter. (laughs) Reach out to him. And you might get his attention. Maybe he can help with those lawyers. So. Yeah, I for me, I um, I'm, yeah, I'm just not I not playing their game anymore. The lawyers, I just said, hey guys, do what you gotta do. I'm gonna make what I'm gonna make. If you're gonna stop me, power to you. Yeah, yeah. All right, Russell. Thank you so much. Take Thanks, care. Bye. Come yeah. back when your movie comes out, and I'll see yeah, you we'll before do. you leave. I'll see you yeah. before you leave. I'll be. I'm around. All right. Thanks, guys. Take care, man. Thanks. Thanks. All right, later.